thank you everyone for joining us today. We have an amazing fireside chat with two amazing people. The point of our talk today will be around ransomware. We have some very different perspective, experiences, and point of views on this major issue for cybersecurity. So I'll let my two guests start today by introducing themselves and we talk a bit more about this problem of ransomware and what they think of it. So we'll start with you, uh, Metzger. Thank you very much, David. Um... Mathieu Chouina, I'm the founder of Infidem and now following an acquisition of Infidem by Atas. Uh, I'm now the head of Cybersecurity Canada for Atas. And for people who doesn't know who is Atas, uh, Atas is the third cybersecurity worldwide leader in managed cybersecurity services. Um, so um, we, are, uh, we are now part of a global company um, around the world. So as a, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I founded in the past uh, two companies, Infidem and Forensic, and I'm talking to you with you uh, regarding my past experience and, and my present experience with Forensic. Forensic is a team uh, specialized into incident response and computer forensics. So we are we are busy, uh, you know, fighting cybercrime with uh, our clients. We combat ransomware every month, every week, business email compromise and breaches. So um, I, I know well the, the, uh, the subject of ransomware. I have many experience in that domain uh, facing, facing that kind of threats. I also uh, personally contributed to NSECM, a Canadian cyber cluster. Um, as a board, uh, I'm a member of the board of director of this uh, global organization in Canada. Cool. Excellent. And we also have Kevin with us. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, thanks, David. Uh, Kevin McGee. I'm the chief security officer for Microsoft Canada. Um, so I have a responsibility for a, a very large and vast portfolio of uh, Microsoft uh, technologies, everything from chip to cloud. Um, you know, that includes things like uh, Surface devices, Xbox, um, email, all sorts of uh, product categories that uh, that we look at from a security lens. So exciting position, uh, great team behind me as well. Um, ransomware is definitely the number one uh, conversation that I'm having with customers from time to time. And uh, the thing that really, I, I guess, interests me or where I spend a lot of my time thinking about and focusing on is not necessarily even the technology behind ransomware. It's the layer eight aspect. It's the people aspect. What are the business drivers? How do we change the economic? economics, not just uh, uh, put up technological barriers uh, for ransomware as well. So great to uh, great to really engage in this discussion um, and be part of your research and, and have a really in-depth discussion on you know, where ransomware has come, where it's headed, and what are the trends we can start preparing for now. Yeah, so and I'll introduce myself. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm David Itsu. I'm the Chief Research Officer of Flare Systems, a Montreal startup that does cybersecurity and helps uh, under companies understand their digital risk and their footprint online. And so maybe, Kevin, you mentioned Xbox. Have we seen the first ransomware for Xbox, or is that yet to come? You know, it, it's funny. Uh, you never really think of that as a threat vector, yeah. but uh, there are a number of evolving threats in the gaming industry. If you think a lot yeah. of, about the altcoins and whatnot, it you know part of that came out of the idea of the World of Warcraft gold and whatnot, as well. So some of the uh, the things we're experiencing seeing now actually you know really began in the gaming community and were professionalized and monetized by a lot of these criminal organizations so which tells us the cybersecurity professionals we, we need to really be looking at a broader scope of where trends are starting to develop and where threat vectors are beginning uh, to mature that may come uh, back to haunt us in the future yeah many things i mean i remember the first days of ransomware where you know the, the first one that appeared and everyone said you know this is too genius. I mean, it's too amazing for it not to become the, the threat that we're facing. And it seems to be this that we're facing today. I mean, it's the one topic we all discuss. And uh, I know, Matthew, you had a lot of experience with customers and, you know, answering or meeting kind of the challenges of ransomware. Um, in your experience, what has been kind of the main source or the main driver for these ransomware infections? Like, how do people get into your customers' computers and networks? There are so many ways uh, wow. from the point of view of an attacker. So if you compare your IT systems today with your body, 
uh, the complexity is there. So if you see complexity in a system, you see vulnerabilities. There is a lot of vulnerabilities. It could be human vulnerabilities. It could be system vulnerability, application, a different point of view. Um, so this is the main problem of, uh, of, uh, of the cybersecurity uh, uh, domain. You know, this is an infinite, infinite game. Uh, this is a never hand game uh, combating cybercrime because you don't have the chance to make an error. Every time you make an error, you um, you face some risk. Well, it's, it's Bruce Schneier that said, you know, like the the good guys need to be perfect all the time. But if your bad guy wants to get in, you have to be successful once, and then it's kind of game over, uh, and and that's it. Um, and I I know we you know we we've talked a lot about, for example, you know, remote desktop protocols being open on the internet. Uh, is that the type of conversation, you know, Kevin, you're, you're getting very often? Are, are people, you also mentioned kind of the, the people aspect of the problem, which is also very interesting uh, when talking about ransomware. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of sort of modern marketing techniques being adopted by uh, by these uh, cyber criminal games. A B testing, you know, they, if they they really you know small cyber gang shows up for work on Monday morning, they have to go through a lead list. They have to uh, to figure out how they're going to make uh, make the rent uh, this week. So it's turning into a business, and they're looking at how do we find you know the uh, organizations, the opportunities that will provide the greatest opportunity, the greatest return on investment, and they're taking the proceeds from uh, ransoms that are paid and reinvesting in them in their business models to expand to the point where we're seeing it's becoming a competitive business now and a whole ecosystem uh, where you can make almost as much money as a cyber criminal building and supplying tools as you can actually doing some of the actual hands-on work um, of cybercrime anymore. So that that adds additional complexity, uh, not just for technical companies and technical folks like ourselves, uh, but law enforcement, you know, what is, you know, how do we manage jurisdictions and whatnot, uh, what laws are applicable. So the complexity outside of technology is growing just as quickly as the complexity within the technology. Yeah, and, and I mean, when even when we look at ransomware, it used to be that it would just encrypt your files and ask for your, you know, for money in Bitcoin. And it was kind of a simple problem. You have backups, you just restore from the backups. And something we're seeing now is actually that they're going to exfiltrate the data and they're going to put it up either for auction on their websites or they're just going to publish it, you know, publicly on the Internet. And this just completely changed the game. And can we even talk about, you know, ransomware anymore? It's more, you know, there, there's so many layers to this type of thread today. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's worried me over the past few months and years is about this question of how can you secure stuff that you don't have control over? And this is exactly, this is especially the case, you know, with ransomware that we've seen recently. Um, and one of the reports that we're working on about third party risks and how, you know, you're going to share information with a lot of partners. I'm sure, Mathieu, you know, in your business, you're part of a huge conglomerate now. I'm sure, you know, they have a lot of information about, uh, about Infidem and your business in Canada and vice versa. And then what do you do with this information and how can you, control this information and make sure it doesn't leak when you're not even the one who's holding on to it. And I don't know if that's something you, you have advice on, Mathieu, is something you, you also worry about, about, you know, who has access to what and how can you force them to handle it securely? Exactly. There are so ma many challenges. Um, we just talked a couple of minutes about it. Uh, there is many vulnerabilities inside the organization, inside the system, but also outside of the organization because all businesses interact between them together and uh, you you if you are in business today uh, your business is to share information and, and to manage information from an IT point uh, point of view because uh, when we're talking about information today this is digital information and this digital information implies that it moves it moves to your suppliers it moves to your customers it moves everywhere so how can you secure something that's moved all around the world every time? That's, that's the main challenge of cybersecurity professionals today. 
Yeah, and uh, I was seeing groups and ransomware groups are going to say, you know, we hacked into this law firm, we hacked into even this cybersecurity because, you know, we're also victims of all this. And, you know, they were saying, you know, this company services Tesla, it services NASA, it services, you know, Microsoft and other big companies. And so they're kind of going after the low hanging fruit. Um, and I know, you know, with, with, with you guys at Microsoft, Kevin, you're hosting how many, how much information is there? I don't even know if you have a number for that. It, it but, changed while we're talking, I can guarantee yeah. it. <laughs> and, you know, how, how can you, you know, how can you help, you know, companies protect their information when they're, you know, hosting it on reserve, for example, and making sure it doesn't leak out? I think we have to go back to first principles in, in every security discussion, and this is nothing new. So if you go back to 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, if you wanted to break in and steal something, or if you're a spy and you wanted to get access to something, you hired you know, or, or bribed or extorted or blackmailed the cleaning company that manages that facility. Um, or when we did physical patent testing, you know, we put on the denim shirts and the khakis and, and walked in and, and acted like we were there to, to fix something. Um, so this is not a new tactic. What's different is just the scale. Uh, where in the physical world, you could maybe, I don't know, hit a couple of banks, I guess, if you were a sophisticated bank robber a year. Uh, now, they're just the, there's a huge, vast scale. So I guess really just looking at the problem from a first principles perspective, this is nothing's changed. How do I now apply the same you know, thought process as, and, and controls to, uh, to making sure that I'm securing uh, my online assets? And that really starts with understanding what is your responsibility? What is the responsibility of other vendors? What are they collecting? What are you collecting in turn? And then starting to hold each other accountable as business partners, either via contracts or whatnot as well. And this is where we're really starting to see government contracts in particular asking for specifics about, you know, how are you handling data? Where is it going to reside? And it's going to be economic drivers like that and building trust via contracts and, and how, uh, how we engage in, in um, business partnerships that are really going to make those changes. Again, much more than the technology behind it, which will then just be there to, to support and sustain those uh, relationships. Uh, but e even then, I mean, their contracts are always one thing, but how do you enforce them? How do you make sure that people are really respecting them? You know, are you going to open up, you know, your network to me so I can poke around? And, you know, do you do pen tests of your partners? Uh, I don't know if that's something that, you know, Kevin, you're, you're seeing. So, you know, I'll share you some document. Well, I'm going to make sure that you're keeping it safe. And, you know, how, how far do you take this, basically? So I look at it from two perspectives. One, it is a huge challenge that we have to figure out. And what will that look like? It, it crosses insurance uh, policies. It crosses yeah. whole sorts of other um, uh, other areas of, of business. It's also a really neat opportunity for startups like yourselves to say, hey, this is a whole new world. What is it that we can do to leverage some of these cloud technologies or these platforms to build innovative solutions? And that's what we're seeing. You know, at Microsoft, we're developing a number of uh, solutions about information protection, data loss prevention, and whatnot. But more importantly, we're opening our security graph to allow an ecosystem of uh, independent uh, software vendors and startups to build amazing mm -hmm. solutions based on our platform to solve problems in unique ways that would have never occurred to us. So we're going back to our roots, uh, you know, in Microsoft, really making that platform available to startups and, and uh, smart, uh, mm -hmm. smart folks out there to, to really start to address these problems as well. And, and I mean, that, that was the, the, the second point I wanted to, to look at is just this notion of innovation. In all of my research, that's been kind of the, the main driver for me. I mean, I think that malicious actors, they're interesting, first of all, because they're innovative. And I mean, with ransomware, no, they didn't really invent anything. Like, they didn't invent a new encryption, they didn't invent cryptocurrencies, they didn't invent the dark web. They just brought this all together and they, they figured out that when you added all these parts, well, it made something that was pretty effective and that was going to have a lot of damage. And I, I think, Mathieu, you're perhaps the, of, of our group here, the one who's been the most in contact directly with the outcome of this innovation. Um, if you had one or two innovation that struck you over the years and something you said, okay, guys, this is 
very bad, but also very cool in terms of an innovation. I never would have thought of doing that myself. Do you have an example of, of such an innovation that you see? Oh, you know, great question. Um, you know, uh, they surprise us uh, every week with their creativity. Uh, it's like kids. It's when you, when you have young kids, they surprise you all the time. Yes, exactly. The they, they will find a way to, uh, to do damages. And they will be very creative. And, and like, uh, like we, we mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, this is a business model. So, so their business model is to extort you money. And uh, they will export you money uh, by 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 doing damages to your company if this is not uh, you know business interruption because the, your 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 data will be uh, completely unavailable. It will be creating damages uh, with uh, with a breach and uh, exfiltration of your data and uh, maybe uh, legal uh, legal problems with your clients customers. And they do it with creative ways. What I expect is that one of the future uh, big concerns will be uh, artificial intelligence. And, and maybe this is one of the idea behind. Um, if you, if, if as a business you did not start to use business intelligence today, you can be sure that hackers have started to use it. And and where do you see this? What role do you see this? You know, AI playing into all of this. Where do you see this intelligence kind of changing the game in the future? For example, that would be a big big game changer uh, in, in many ways. Uh, it could be you know identical problems, but they already use it uh, for creating new vector of attack and accelerating automation uh, of their attacks. So. Um, Businesses are slow to innovate uh, comparing to hackers. Yeah. Well, the, 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 there was a couple of years, I don't know if they hold these every year, but they had these competitions of AI trying to hack other AI. And that was always kind of a fun thing to, to watch. Uh, but yeah, but we'll, we'll be talking about kind of solutions um, soon. But, you know, on your end, Kevin, like in terms of innovation, uh, is there something that struck you that you heard that, you know, bad guys were doing and you're just amazed that they took that, that road, basically, that you were not expecting? Well, I, I'll go a different route. I'll kind of go what's old is new again. So I think about, <laughs> you know, AI, everyone talks about AI, kind of the new shiny objects. Well, what happened when they, when they combine that with sort of old-fashioned scams, like the romance um, scam? And I can then disguise myself as Nicole Kidman and, uh, you know, really do a, uh, with a deep fake, do a romance scam uh, yeah. with video. Um, so I see them adapting uh, newer technologies to just old scams. Um, the other one we see is uh, now, I don't know if you've seen this in, in your research, but um, they're using phone calls uh, to call ransomware victims uh, that instead of email. And, and so that's bridging the gap to, uh, you know, really, really reach the victim and create a sense of urgency on, a, on an emotional level that's different than just receiving an email. The other innovation I've seen is uh, they'll have the ransom note print off the printer. So for yeah. some folks having you know this ransomware that's affected your computer, it's all digital. But when something comes off the printer, now they've they've really infected the, the physical world. It creates a, a new level of fear and a new uh, sense of urgency uh, within uh, within the victim. So you also see them experimenting with these sort of psychological aspects of um, technology, and I suspect we're going to see much more of that as well. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm always surprised that this ransomware thing just works because you know for most people you get a pop up in your computer that says you have. 48 hours to get some bitcoins. You know, first question is, you know, what is Bitcoin? How do I buy them? How do I send them to the right person? And, you know, there's all these fees and everything. And I, I'm, I, for some time, I was a bit surprised. I, I questioned myself, like, are people going to pick up on it and be able to do it? And I know, you know, my, my, my own research center was hit by this rent, by a ransomware attack a few years back. And, you know, the staff was really puzzled as, okay, well, now the clock is ticking and you have this huge clock. And as you say, like the, the psychological aspect is so important with ransomware. And that's where I think they, they nailed it, you know, just to begin with. Uh, 
I remember all the messages talking about, you know, military grade encryption and making sure that, you know, you, you're not never going to be able to crack this, even though in many cases you could. Um, but just kind of this innovation of getting this sense of urgency to people was extremely powerful. And, you know, in the, over the course of it, maybe they taught a lot of people about, you know, what Bitcoins are and how do you pay, you know, your, your ransom to it. And, uh, yeah. So um, moving on from this, uh, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about how they're always innovating, uh, how they're even using the phone. And that's, you know, the malicious actors, more and more I'm seeing them using the phone. And even when I'm talking with, you know, fraudsters and hackers online, very often they'll just ask me to join on an audio call. I'm always surprised why they would want to talk with us, but apparently it's it's a thing. Maybe they're working so from I, home too. It's COVID. Yeah, they're lonely too. Maybe they're lonely too. Maybe they're lonely too. But yeah, I'm always surprised that they want to talk to us. And so so basically, I mean, there there's a million different things that we can tell people, you know, this is how you prevent it. This is how you, you kind of protect yourself. Um, but is there kind of one thing that, really moves the needle like Matsu, when you're talking to customers is there one thing you're like you know this was super simple like why wasn't that there already in your organization like what's the one thing you're always you know be fundled that it's not there and should be there basically there is so many but the first one that is you know creating uh the other one is if I have one recommendation to uh, to clients, to organization, is to invest into their people, particularly into their people in IT, because the IT world is constantly changing at a fast pace. And if you do not keep your people with, uh, you know, being on the edge with technologies, you will have many problems. I see so many organizations being, uh, you know, uh, five to seven to 10 years old of technologies, not patches, not, not being, uh, you know, upgraded uh, because uh, there is no investment in the people uh, and the te technology for sure. But, but if you invest in the, tech in the technologies and your people have not the competencies, uh, you will be in a trouble. So this is where we ask you, Kevin, how, how much do you spend on training your people? Um, and, yeah. Well, and, I, and to, so it's a great point, you know, and, and people really are going to make the difference. And, and this is where I really, we really struggle with most, um, most, most discussions I have with CISOs. Because I'll, I'll say, what, what is your biggest concern? Ransomware. What does the, the main adversary to your organization look like highly creative, uh, clever, ingenious, probably has no formal training, self-taught, um, uses you know um, open source tools or whatnot. And so, who are you hiring? You know, who are you putting on your team to defend against this person? Oh, computer science majors, you know, with uh, that got the highest marks in their school. Is that the right you know mix of people really to defend against that adversary? You know, um, a really you know deep technical engineer can set up all the equipment or whatnot, but then you know can be fished or or, um, or have a social engineering attack. So how do you start to think about your team differently? How do you start to make your team again look like your adversary more? And that might be if ransomware is a concern, could you add a criminologist to your team? Could you add a former law enforcement? Agency. I myself have a history degree. What I bring really to the cybersecurity realm is a way of thinking about, you know, bias, thinking about uh, really uh, what what is uh, behind that or what is the motivation? How do I structure an argument? Uh, that sort of thing and looking for patterns in a much different way. So diversity in thought, diversity in thinking, diversity in education, gender, and even age. Um, I myself at uh, Microsoft, I have a emerging leadership um, uh, board that of young folks under 30 that advise me. I don't mentor them and tell them how to, you know, where the, the future is going or where the industry is going. They tell me and their perspective is so unique, so different and really informs my decision making and thinking so significantly. I wish more uh, more senior execs and, and CISOs would, 
not would look at diversifying their team as a major um, um, a major um, initiative within their organizations. And kind of you know for, for the both of you, that, that's super interesting. And but how do you make the security people listen to these kind of? outsiders, you know, even inexperienced outsiders moving in and tell them, okay, so have you thought of this? Have you looked at this? I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure. Kevin, like, how do you mix these people together and make sure they it pays off rather than slows down the machine, basically? It's probably, you know, thinking about uh, agile model. Uh, if you can put those different competencies together in, 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 into an agile mode, you, you will be able to, to create, uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, with different perspective uh, working together and, and being in, into a creative mode. And so th does it really work? I mean, can it work? <laughs> it can. We do a similar, um, a similar approach on our team. So we, we, a proposed hypothesis. This is what I think we should do or change or whatnot. We'll build a uh, virtual team to test it and we'll add the, the resources we need to really uh, to figure that out. We'll go test it. We'll see how it works. We'll come back with the evidence and say, hey, do we persevere? Do we pivot? Where do we go next? Um, and it's that, the, that sort of quick cycles, proposing an idea and then acting on it immediately and, and integrating those lessons learned. That's how we learn faster. And that's how we can really keep ahead of the bad guys is if we can learn and adapt faster or at least even just keep up with them, it is a major advantage. Um, so having those diverse opinions, making, uh, making space for people to have those opinions. And if you think back to the early days of security, it was the peculiar, uh, peculiar people who really you know, started in security. We weren't exactly the normal um, uh, folks on the team. We had the crazy ideas and whatnot. And I think we're starting to professionalize and commoditize the industry to a point where we're trying to turn cybersecurity into accounting and it's not the same type of business you know how do we keep that creativity that the original word of the hacker um, that you know looks at something and wants to take it apart and learn how it works uh, but also build it uh, a profession around uh, it as well so we can't just sort of hire the old-fashioned hacker there's got to be a, a happy uh, medium and we seem to be leaning too much towards the professionalization of our um, of our industry, and I think that's to the detriment because we're losing that creativity we need. And, but I, I think it. No, go ahead, that's and, yeah. and break the silos into your organization because yes. you know all all the ways to see cybersecurity is to put them in a silos and and and, and guiding uh, other other teams, but bring break those silos and put the cybersecurity staff into other teams to see the challenges they have to perform, to, to, to guide them, to, to, uh, to learn about, you know, uh, their, their own challenges. Well, it, it's kind of like what I'm hearing, it's more about, you know, being proactive than reactive. I mean, I, when you're looking, you know, from an engineer point of view is you find a flaw and then you fix it. But when you're going, you know, looking at the humans and having this diversity of opinion, it, to me, it's always been about trying to understand what hackers are doing, what most sectors are doing, so you can predict what's going to happen afterwards and not waiting for it, you know, to appear on Krebs and security and then you get a patch for it and then you fix the problem. And it's it's also, you know, going back to Bruce Schneier, you know, the, the kind of the movie plot and, you know, the, the security theater of airports where some guy, you know, walks in with a bomb, you know, in his shoes and now we take off our shoes. Someone comes in, you know, with a bomb in their, you know, in their pants. Now, you know, we have to pat down the pants. We all keep our pants on, fortunately. <laughs> but it seems as though too often we take security as we'll be passive and reactive and we'll wait for, you know, the malicious actors to find something, then we'll fix it and we'll wait till the next crisis happens. Is that kind of you, how you see security too often these days? Yeah, I can uh, start. Um, I, I really use the analogy of arrows and archers. So we're so fixated on stopping the individual arrow, arrows. We look at how do we stop the Ryak arrow? And then we've got a patch or we've got a solution for the Ryak arrow. 
Um, but the archer might then just choose to fire a different arrow at you. So <laughs> studying the, the threat actor and really understanding the TTP of the threat actor. So what is their signature? Because people are, are creatures of habits. So threat actors are going to develop a certain set of toolkits, a certain uh, way of doing things. And if you can start to build a signature of the threat actors that are most likely to attack your organization and monitor them for changes in their behavior, then you can get ahead uh, when they start to change behavior to build out your defenses and your security posture to really um, stop the archer, not the individual arrows. Because we'll never keep up doing this the way we're doing it now. We really have to change how we're thinking about uh, security. And it is really, I believe, it's studying the, uh, the threat actors, like you mentioned. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's, that's what we do at Flare. And like, Mathieu, like how many of your customers, you know, and the companies you help secure are actually doing that? I mean, looking at the tactics and the threat actors, is that something everyone does? Or you're like, oh, there's this one guy I used to know in 96 that did that, but I haven't seen it since. You know, very few, very few companies huh. are doing that. Um, and that's a big challenge for, for everyone, having the right staff, having the right people, having the right way to do that, um, investing into technologies and humans. So, so this is, this is as, as, as I mentioned in uh, entry point, this is an infinite, infinite game. So never end game. You must every day restart your thinking and uh, rethinking your model attack, rethinking about your threat hunting and, and, and trying to do the, the best you can. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we're part of, you know, that what, what Flair does is part of, you know, cyber threat intelligence. And there's always this question of, uh, you know, there's all these companies collecting data from all these threat actors, all having kind of pieces of the answers and pieces of the information. And there's always a struggle between, of course, there's going to be, you know, competitive and business advantages to having the biggest catalog. But how do we bring all this information together and make sure that, you know, we have one part of the answer and we know some of the stuff that the threat actor is doing. And how do we bring all of this together? I think for the cyber threat industry is going to be something that's going to be key moving forward. And how can we collaborate rather than compete and saying, you know, like, I have access to this exclusive platform. Maybe you have access to another platform. And how do we bridge a gap and bring these together? Um, that's that's something that, you know, we, we are thinking a lot about, about collaboration. And or even, you know, companies talking, I, I don't know, you know, you guys, you know, at Microsoft, like, you know, how often do you talk with your peers about, you know, we've been attacked this way and, you know, being open about kind of disinformation and learning from each other, basically. So this might surprise you. Uh, we see eight, tra 8 trillion threat signals a day right now. Um, right. And we share that with our competitors in a uh, mm -hmm. in, in uh, um, threat intel um, sharing models, really because all of the cloud uh, providers have the same mission. It's really to you know provide services to the customers and secure the customers. So attack on one mm -hmm. is attack on all. So yeah. you're seeing a lot more coordination um, and sharing in the private sector than you do in co with customers or governments. Um, we have a, a program called MISA, which is the Microsoft Information um, Security Association, where we have uh, a lot of what would you consider our um, competitors that we work yeah. with. And we just actually um, released a number of awards um, that we've sponsored to companies that you might perceive as competitors, but we are working together. And I think the recent attacks on um, security providers has really shown um, how our industry responded, I think, in a really good way. An attack on one is attack on all. So we shouldn't yeah. celebrate when a competitor is attacked. They're, they're on the same team. We're all defenders. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is starting to really uh, bring our industry together and really get us focused on that mission. Uh, because that's the only way uh, we're really going to succeed. The more we share, the more we cooperate, the more we work together. Um, the bad guys do. Um, we need to mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and breaking down those barriers is one of the main uh, main roles that I have as well. It's working with ISVs, it's working with startups um, to really see how they can plug into our ecosystem to really uh, enable and achieve more. Well, and, and there's a lot of discussions. I mean, you know, we're in 2021, you know, some people have asked, why do we still have crime? Like, how come we haven't solved that problem yet? And that's a big question. But, you know, one of the answers that we've seen is that the malicious actors and the offenders, they're 
way more organized to attack you know, companies and their victims than the victims are to receive these attacks and deal with them. And it's always a question of, you know, are we ready to invest? Are we ready to organize ourselves? And very often, you know, people are going to be lazy. People are going to have other priorities. And then you realize that you're facing a threat actor that is much better than you are. And at that point, you know, what do you do? Well, you fall victim to these attacks. Um, and, you know, talking about this, I mean, when I when we were doing kind of the everyone does their end of year kind of blog post, you know, about you know the threats, the trends for 2021, and pretty much everything I've read for 2021, everyone mentioned, you know, ransomware is going to be a big trend uh, throughout the year. Do you guys see 2022 when you guys, I don't know if you guys are going to be writing blog posts about this, but, you know, when you're going to be doing your predictions for 2022, do you think we're going to see as many ransomware everywhere? Or is it going to be a ransom crypto new thing that we're going to see in these predictions? I don't know, Matt, sure what, what's your take on this? Yes, you know, I, I don't think that the ransomware will be will decline in the next future. Um, because mainly we are facing more and more and more complexity over the years. And this is one of the main challenges we face against attackers. Also, uh, you know, this is like in the human, uh, human healthcare. We see every year the same patterns of not patching the system, not upgrading, not, not doing, you know, the, the hygiene of the buzz. So the basic hygiene of computers uh, configuration. So I don't think that this is uh, a decline situation. Um, we will face it over and over and over again in the past, in the future uh, years. Are you more optim optimistic, Kevin, about this issue and this problem? Well, I think we're starting to think about it differently. So in, in terms of trends, we, we, we tend to look at the technology first, and I think we're starting to step back. And, you know, the questions I'm asking are, go back to basics, the CIA triangle. If you think about what ransomware was, it was taking away availability. It locked down your system, mm -hmm. and you, you lost availability. Then the next evolution was confidentiality. How do we, uh, as cyber criminals, look at doxing you or 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 taking advantage of you from the, the confidentiality lens. What's the integrity lens look like for the future? That's how I'm starting to think about it. Will it be um, poisoning uh, machine learning or AI models? Will it be um, you know, uh, tampering with a chain of custody for legal documents or, or law enforcement? You know, will it be changes to the blood type uh, in a patient record as opposed to locking up? What's the integrity um, view? Because that's where the next uh, um, layer of innovation, I think, will come from these cyber criminals. So how do we start thinking ahead? And then how do we apply the model to other things? Right now, we're just sort of ransoming, uh, they're ransoming computers and whatnot. What's it going to look like when they start applying ransomware techniques and, and business models to cars that are now connected? Um, could they, you know, brick your car and, and ransom it? What happens when they do a denial of service attack by bricking hundreds of cars on the 401 at, uh, at rush hour? What are those other vectors? And we need to start thinking about those creatively now um, and then building out uh, solutions to prevent them uh, just to stay ahead of the of the uh, the bad guys. That will be the secret for the, the coming years. Yeah. Oh, cool. So very, very good food for thought. So that's all the time we had for today. So I really want to thank both of you for joining us today extremely stimulating talk and we'll see in our predictions 2022 if you guys are right or not hopefully not so much but still uh, i really want to thank you so kevin Matsir, thank you for joining us and uh, we'll talk soon thank you both